So, first of all, um, let me get this out of the way. I, I, my name is Jeffrey. I'm not giving you my last name. I do work in the intelligence community. No, you can't spot me anymore. It's too late. Too obvious. Um, and I have actually been required to provide you guys with this disclaimer. Everything that I put out here as to, uh, as to my solution for, for protecting these uh, internet-enabled alarm system monitoring panels it, it is not to be considered officially sanctioned policy by the United States government. It's only my particular solution in areas where uh, facilities that I actually am responsible for. And uh, so any issues you have with it, you know, come yell at me. Don't, don't yell at any of the feds. It's not their fault. Okay, basically what, 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 my, what we're here to discuss is uh, alarm systems in general, and more specifically, um, issues uh, involved with um, monitoring the, the status of the alarm systems and, and issues in protecting those, those uh, alarm monitoring uh, pieces, the hardware that is used to do that. Essentially, uh, there, are, there are really essentially two, maybe three types of alarms. Most people associate when they, when they when they discuss when they talk about an alarm system, most people associate that with either uh, a fire alarm, which you know basically detects s smoke or fire in a facility, and then it, it alerts the authorities or or inhabitants of the area to the problem. And then more commonly, which is both residential and and commercial, burglar alarms, which essentially do the same thing except without fire. Uh, quite often, you'll find them uh, find uh, both types of alarms in one facility. And burglar alarms, basically the same thing. Uh, they they detect unauthorized intrusion into your facility, and then and then um, alert whoever the appropriate individual is to to the situation. Okay. Excuse me. Moisture. Um, none of that. Well, I. I don't know. I don't know. Laz, uh, by the way, there's an individual up up front who's a friend of mine who actually does a lot of physical security. I do more network security side, but so occasionally I will defer to him on that. Uh, are you aware of any um, sensors that actually are, are are designed for moisture? Would that be uh, in the safety systems more than the the burglar or fire? There's a sensor for it. You want to come on up here and make it easier? Come on up, Laz. Come on up. Come on up. No, you're not. You're not officially speaking. Okay, um, my my caveat would be I don't I don't deal with the moisture ones because frankly all my stuff is in these li lovely nice as you've heard from uh, our lovely vice president man size safes so if they get if they get flooded I don't care as long as they don't float out the window and you get what's in them yeah. plus he's never gotten a woman moist in his life <laughs> supposed to laugh a little bit. so anyway go, uh, you can go ahead and there, there's sensors for everything moisture heat. Um, Biochem sensors, air quality sensors, there's sensors for everything. An alarm's an alarm. The control panels are the panels, and he'll go into more of that. But there's sensors for absolutely everything out there. Okay. Basically, this is the anatomy of, of, of a burglar alarm, which is the most common alarm I have to deal with in my facilities. Because I, I really, again, I don't care if the things blow up, burn up, or, or get completely moistened, as long as you don't get what's on them. So all I care about is if you're coming in there and looking around. So the basic topology of a, of a burglar alarm is you have a central panel that controls all the signals and everything else is basically in a, a seemingly spoken wheel topology with all the sensors lying on the outer sides. And there are multiple, multiple types of sensors. Um, most businesses will use, usually use one, maybe two of the types of sensors in areas that they care about. Uh, military installations and some businesses that actually uh, make a lot of money and are really paranoid will use multiple sensors in an area to protect it. Uh, generally, my, my facilities, every door has a balanced magnetic trigger on it. Every room has IR sensors that are set up to optimally monitor the room. Um, and if, for some godforsaken reason, the area has a window, there's, you know, we put glass breaks. Um, and then the last, the last piece of the puzzle is what, what the, the, the main item of my talk is about, is 
monitoring the actual status of the of the alarm system. So, uh, in addition to the sensors and the main panel, you have the the monitoring hardware connected. All right. Now, this is basically, in my opinion, the de evolution of of alarm system monitoring hardware. Uh, many, many many years ago. <clears throat> Excuse me, and if and if you can't hear me, let me let me know, and I'll speak up. Um, it, when when it, when it first began, not that many people used alarms because they're very expensive. So you you either had had a lot of money, like you were the government, or a really big business, and you really really cared because you were willing to to pay out lots of money to monitor your alarm system. And the way it was done was generally a dry copper pair pulled into your facility, um, otherwise known as a T1. And they, they work lovely. They're dedicated lines solely for your use, but they're extremely expensive. However, um, the reason I, I, I titled this slide The Evolution is from, from a, uh, a security standpoint, that's probably the most trivial thing to protect. Because all you got to do is harden your DMARC. And and you know anything anything beyond the the phone switches is out of your control anyway, and you're not going to be the only one affected really. So that's that's pretty easy to protect. You just harden you just harden your lease line, you harden your DMARC, and it's almost solely a physical security issue. Along uh, along along the lines, after a few years, uh, the alarm companies uh, realized that the most of the, most of the uh, most of the people that were using alarms at that time all had, you know, POTS, plain, plain old telephone service lines in their facility. So they began using the, uh, the ubiquitous POTS lines um, as, their, as their monitoring uh, data communication channel because it was far, it was far, it was common. You know, it wasn't something they had to, to specifically bring into the facility because it was almost always there. And it's very cheap. But it was about the 80s that they moved to RF and, and cellular. Yeah, around the 80s, um, they they discovered that well, it was easier to to you know take some of the expense of, of maintaining POTS lines or, or requiring POTS lines and um, move it over into cellular and, and uh, radio backup systems, which then all they had to do was is either maintain the the towers and things like that, or you know um, outsource to to somebody else like Sprint. Or whomever, and they had to maintain the infrastructure. Um, the problem with that is, well, it's it's not that it's, it's not that it's difficult to, to secure. It's just it's out of your hands, and you are subject to any outages uh, um, on this other this other person's uh, infrastructure. So a lot of a lot of the uh, quality of service and stuff is now out of your hands. Um, however, you have less to secure at your facility. Um, and then, long about mid to late 90s and now basically most alarm systems especially new ones that are getting installed the alarm companies uh, aren't offering you uh, in general they're not offering you cellular backups um, they're pushing the internet enabled uh, monitoring hardware reason being because there's very little um, there's very little infrastructure they have to maintain with that and, and frankly they say well everybody everybody we, we deal with whether it be you know you at your home or you at your business, we've all got broadband access at this point, so why not make use of it? And all they have to do is maintain a, re a receiver station at, the, at, the, at their facility, and they put, this, they, they put this client panel in on your system and call it a day. Um, and obviously, it should be obvious to a lot of people here uh, why I, I, I and quite a few people actually consider this a bad idea, because now quality of service uh, the quality of your your internet connection becomes highly important. Um, you're, you're, I mean, if if you've got a lot of people that are playing playing online games on your <laughs> on your network, um, now now your your alarm system sta status packets have to compete with that traffic, um, and you begin to start getting a lot of false positives when when you start getting uh, your network flooded. Um, Basically, uh, there there are there are quite a few of the uh, internet-enabled uh, alarm um, hardware, but two of the two of the examples that I'm familiar with and that that are that are most commonly um, deployed are ones made by a company called uh, uh, DMP, which basically makes a lot of the or 
they uh, own DMP or Ademco, and they, they basically make a majority of the sensors that, that are deployed in, in alarm systems. Um, they make a product that's called the ICOM or the ICOM E. The only difference between ICOM and ICOM E is ICOM E, um, they, they added a uh, AES encryption engine onto it. So frankly, if you have the option of getting ICOM or ICOM E, they're not that much, they're not that different in cost. And you know, one of them is going unencrypted. So, yeah. and then the other major, the other, the other more uh, common one is uh, is a uh, a product called AlarmNet. Uh, the specific, well, there's a whole series of, of uh, alarm data monitoring hardware uh, under the AlarmNet name. Um, this particular one is the AlarmNet I, which is you know for internet. Um, yeah, or the uh, the common the common reference uh, the model number for it, it with Honeywell is 7845I. Um, and these are basically the two most common that, that yeah, if if you're deploying a new a new alarm system, these are probably the two that, that you're going to be asked to choose from. Yes, yes. Actually, both of them do. Um, in fact, the, the, the alarm that one, you, you don't have to choose whether you want unencrypted or encrypted. The, 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 uh, the alarm that product actually by default comes with encryption. And what's actually I find kind of nice about it is you get to cho choose which algorithm you want. The, and I'll get to it in a little while, but the DMP only uses AES and the alarm that lets you choose um, in deference to one of the keynote speakers here, Blowfish or AES. In fact, I think uh, the alarm net defaults to Blowfish. So you actually have to change the option to move it to AES. Some of us don't have a choice. Okay, um, basically the, uh, the DMP uh, product, uh, it's, you, you have a choice between either UDP or TCP for your, for your reporting traffic. Uh, it defaults to UDP, so you have to, if you want a little bit of, uh, a little bit of uh, transaction integrity with TCP, you have, you have to change the option and tell it you want TCP. Um, the port is configurable on it, however, uh, the default from the factory is, is port 2001. And frankly, let's be honest, how often do you think the install tech bothers to change any of factory defaults unless you actually insist? Um, so the, this will come into play later when we discuss actually snarfing around on your network to try and find these things, just because you're curious. Uh, uh, now, one of, the, one of the things I find interesting about it is that uh, it also, it, it uses, if you choose AES, the, uh, the uh, AES key is 128 bit, um, which I find disappointing because the alarm net, um, if you, it, when you deploy the uh, alarm net one, uh, the key is actually a 256 bit, which since the overhead isn't that big these days and, and embedded equipment is fairly, fairly, you know, resource, fairly well done. Um, a 256-bit AES key is not really going to be too much trouble for it to use, so why didn't they bother using the largest key size? I don't know. Um, one thing that's, that's interesting is that uh, the, uh, the DMP guys, if you actually read their little marketing stuff, they, they tout all their lovely security features on there, and um, some of them, for, for people who are you know, in this community who actually attend DEF CON at, at least once, maybe more than once, uh, having having a bit of a clue, you'll, you'll actually find some of the the uh, the, the reasoning um, fairly laughable. And the, and the sad point is, this is not their sales stuff. This is the basically this is the in, the install tax information. Um, I got it because I shoulder surfed my tech, and when he left all this stuff, I kept it. Um, so basically, one of the things that they that they touted as being sec uh, being a security feature is the fact that their communication protocol is proprietary and rides on top of TCP/IP. And yeah, nobody's ever figured out a proprietary protocol, have they? Um, and actually, even worse than that, uh, I will read to you the application note for the tech that 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 is is what they are told to you to spout back to you when you ask about the security features. Um, the, the, really, the really sad part is, is this last little bit, and I'll read it off, it's a little long, but I'll read it off because I think some people at least get a kick out of it, um, especially here. 
uh, considering what, what's taken place at this DEF CON. Um, furthermore, it would be extremely difficult for a hacker to break into a panel or central station receiver through the network monitoring connection because several pieces of unfamiliar information are required to gain access. A potential hacker would have to know all of the following information. Account number. Now, account number, okay, granted, I can understand how they, how they think that's a problem. But, you know, I don't know, it, generally, you know, all of us who, who have alarm systems, everybody gets a little card. And guess what's on the top of that card? The account number, because, hey, when you screw up and you actually have to talk to the data we're monitoring people and go, yeah, I know I set off the alarm, but I'm really supposed to be allowed to be here, first thing they ask you is read off the alarm, can, you know, read, read off the alarm account number on your card, please. So all you got to do is go to somebody's desk while you're wandering around pretending to be delivery boy or whatever, and take take the uh, take the the push pin <laughs> alarm account card off their cork board with you, Xerox it, put it back. Now you go to the account number. The next one is IP address, and you know I, I'm sure nobody here knows how to use Nmap and figure out you know what IPs are available on the network, and then. Uh, um, in addition to that, they say the port number used by the system, and as I discussed previously, granted the, the port is configurable, but it defaults to 2001, and what do you want to bet they didn't change it? So all you got to do is go, go map the network for anything on port 201, uh, 2001, you probably found the alarm net. But beyond that, they, they, they actually have one semi-valid, which is panel secret remote key, which is basically the shared secret. Um, that they use. It, I, I can tell you from my own experience, having shoulder surfed uh, install at several of my facilities, um, in, in more than one state, as a matter of fact, um, the shared secret is only eight characters, and I didn't actually just breathe over his shoulder, but it looked to me as if it's the same one everywhere. <laughs> And then the last one is their lovely feeling that their proprietary communication protocol running atop a TCP IP is actually going to save you. So, you know, good luck. Um, but the, the point I wanted to make actually in my talk is they're talking about access to the system. And frankly, I can tell you from, from my perspective, uh, dealing, dealing in, in, uh, in, in highly classified security environments, I, I don't really care to get access to your system. If I can disrupt it, I can make it useless. And as long as I make your alarm system useless, you're not going to look at what I'm doing anywhere else. You're going to pay attention to all the phone calls coming in from Honeywell or ADT. You're going to pay attention to all the people you know, complaining that, that they're getting alerts from the alarm system, and you're not going to pay attention to anything else. Okay, and now, now uh, uh, a little bit about the, uh, the alarm net one. Um, it only uses TCP, so you don't have to have a nice little, nice little uh, default there. You don't have to bother deciding whether or not UDP or TCP is good. And one point that I forgot to mention earlier, um, and make earlier is that you know, w what we're talking about here is, is you got guys who normally don't do network stuff. You know, these guys, uh, as, far as, as far as they're concerned, the computer is that thing that, that, that plays solitaire for them all day. So, you know, asking them whether or not they want to use UDP or TCP is meaningless to them. You know, they don't know whether, whether one is better than the other. So they'll just go, oh, whatever, you know, whatever, whatever you think is good, go ahead. And, you know, so naturally the tech's going to just leave it at the default. Um, now, uh, the, the Honeywell on the downside, the port is not configurable. So there's, there's your big tip on if you want to find one of the Honeywells. Anything running on port 54109 TCP, you probably found one. And then in, in a second, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, well, you, you can see at the bottom if you in-map it, if you got an object, if you got a node on your network and it's running, it's running you know, it responds in some way, um, on uh, 54.109 TCP, and you see in the uh, you see in the the in-map scan that the uh, the the network uh, adapter is identified as a Demco. Bingo. That's you know you know definitively that's a honey that's an alarm net I device. Um, now the the nice thing, as I mentioned earlier about the about the alarm net I, is you actually get to choose which encryption protocol you use. 
And, and if you're in a if if you're a general business or, or even residential, this is actually not specific to just you know businesses and military and all that. They're actually starting to deploy these in, in residentials too, which which is another point that I, that I wanted to make in this this talk is that you know how many how many people out in out in suburbia are actually going to care about all this stuff? You know, they're not. They're they're, they're frankly, uh, and and all all the uh, DMP stuff and the alarm that stuff they they don't actually insist that you that you segregate this from the net at all they their feeling is it's perfectly fine to stick this straight on the net because hey nobody ever probes things on the net do they so you you actually have a choice it defaults to blowfish frankly i love blowfish i'd be more than happy to use blowfish AES is actually a very good algorithm um, for my for my purposes and for anybody here that actually deals in um, facilities that have that nasty acronym SCIF, you have no choice. You have to use AES. The reason you do is because AES is UL 2040 certified. And you cannot, in, in a, 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 a um, SCIF or any other uh, classified military environment, you cannot use any, any algorithm that's not been UL 2040 certified. So you have no choice but to default to AES. And then of course, they, the, both of the, both of the, the um, monitoring panels will default back to a pot, a plain old tele telephone service dialer. And that's, that's their backup method. If they can't communicate over the network because you flooded it, um, or, or whatever's happened, the, the router's down or whatever, then they will, they will, back, they will flip over to the, the alternative, which is the dialer, which we'll call the central station. But basically what the dialers do is they, they dial the central station, then they hang up. And the central station calls back in and, and, and gets, it checks the status and all that. Um, and again, this goes back to people who deal with SCIFs, you don't have this option. I'll explain that in a little bit. Okay, this is some of the characteristics. Some of this is, is I've already gone over. Um, but basically, you know, D the DMP runs on port 2001. It is configurable, but generally you're gonna find nobody ever changes it. Um, defaults to UDP. The reporting central station is a, a, a piece of hardware known as a CSC1R. Um, and uh, in, in, in uh, DMP's, in, in DMP Ademco's fa uh, favor, I will actually say, that uh, that um, it's not easy to get a hold of their their equipment. Um, unfortunately, it's not quite the same with the, with the alarm net eye equipment, um, which will play into disruption and attack scenarios later. Um, the and then with with the alarm net, it, it defaults. To, well, you have no choice. It uses uh, TCP port fifty four one zero nine. Um, and then uh, it reports to uh, an, an alarm net product called the 7810IR. Um, uh, and what I found is doing a little looking around, um, you can actually go on eBay and for 100 bucks, you can buy the reporting note. Um, and as I mentioned, this actually will play, in, uh, play a key part in, in attack and disruption scenarios uh, later in the talk. Um, Oh, one, one of the other amusing things about the DMP product um, in, in their extremely secure product, uh, one of the defaults is you can configure the entire panel across the LAN with Telnet. Yeah. Now, the alarm net, uh, as I said, reports to, to a uh, 7810IR. Um, that yeah uh, reports to a 7810 IR now the nice thing about the alarm net is you can't actually configure it over the network um, it, it takes effort to to and, and a little bit of extra hardware to actually um, make it network accessible the default way for com for configuration on the alarm net product is the uh, the uh, um, alarm net device it's a it's an RS232 handheld configuration panel um, and it's it's a the device is called the 70 7720p. So okay, now now it's wonderful because you think okay, well I can only configure it with this one device. But guess what? Go back to our friend eBay. You can buy one for thirty bucks. <laughs> so 
Basically, um, now the DMP product, as I mentioned, they're, they're very, very uh, careful about, about accessing it. You have to be a, a valid, verified vendor before they'll even sell the, the, the reporting nodes um, to you. So the chances that, that you're going to be able to go out and get it um, are much, much less. Uh, however, I'm sure if you go talk to Kevin Mitnick, he'd probably be, help you, uh, be happy to help you do a little social engineering and pretend you're a vendor. Uh, okay, now basically the, this is some really sanitized traffic just to give you guys an idea of, of what the traffic looks like so you can see what it looks like. And we have actually, we have actually noticed that there are indeed certain patterns that, that show up both in the, the, uh, the, the window sizes and in the sequence numbers. There's not enough here to actually see the patterns, but at the end of the talk, oh, I have actually set up a wiki for anybody who's interested in joining um, a few of us that, that, that are working on this, on, on playing with these things and, and seeing what we can find out about them. Um, and, and we actually have uh, extensive traffic captures up there that you're welcome to download. And, uh, and, and, you know, fire up TCP dump or Wireshark, read them in, and go look at them, and, and you will start to notice there are a lot of, a lot of patterns in there. So the, uh, our, 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 our main goal is to basically um, reverse engineer the proprietary communication protocol just, just to, to point out to them that that's not a security feature and, you know, please do something about. And, and, and I'm also trying to, as I'll mention later, uh, we're, we're also trying to talk to them about other scenarios for, for trying to at least mitigate some of these issues. Um, but yeah, this is, this is basically what, what, if you see traffic along these lines, um, you know, and, and you'll notice they, they do definitely repeat. You get, you, get a, you get the normal TCP traffic with, with a little bit of a twist because you get the send coming back with a send act and then you get the ACK, but then you get a push ACK and a push ACK back and then a reset and that's it. That's all you get. You know, there's no, there's no come, ACK coming back for the client ever and then it just starts over and it's really odd and, and we've noticed that, that some of the windows uh, links today and looking at the actual payloads on the things, if, if, you, if you pull down the, the traffic captures that we have at the, uh, up on our wiki, um, You'll, you'll notice that the payloads uh, actually have certain areas that never change. So we're, we're fairly certain that we have, a, have an idea of what they're using for an IV for their keys too. Um, which also led us to believe that, frankly, all the, all the, uh, all the um, key, the shared secrets that they're putting in are probably the same everywhere. And then here's the example of, of traffic out of the uh, DMP, ICOM-E. And again, you, you, you can actually notice that some of the, some of the, uh, some of the traffic patterns, uh, there, are, there, are certain, there are certain patterns that do show up in the traffic. And it's very similar to the other one, although you actually do see in the DMP product that somebody there must have read TCP IP Illustrated at some point because they understood that you should send a fend at the end. So they actually do halfway close the connection. All right. Um, now, this is this is really what I wanted to to, to stress here is, is what are the considerations you have to to take into account when your system you're you're deploying a new alarm system and you're being told you're going to monitor it via the net, um, and basically at this point, quality of service on your network becomes of the utmost importance. And you know, frankly, I do deal with firewalls, routers. And I personally am not really good with QoS. I mean, I can, I can make it work, but it takes a long time. I, I know a few people are really good with QoS, but I'm not one of them. And what are the chances that most of the people that work in the physical security side are too? Um, which leads to yet another, another issue that I'll address later. Um, now, as I mentioned earlier, if you're, if you're in a classified environment, Specifically, one that 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 is is uh, covered by the security rules set forth in in uh, DCID six slash nine, and most of the feds will be happy to explain to you what that is. It's basically it's a director of central intelligence directive that tells you what security criteria you must meet to protect an SCI facility. Um, and one of the things in the uh, Annex B that I've that I've denoted there is that you cannot have two-way communication to your to your uh, alarm system. So 
guess what? That nice little lovely backup dialer, you're not allowed to have it. Why? Because the, uh, the system, when the backup dialer calls, calls, calls into the station, the station will call back to you. At that point, the station can actually um, check all your sensors and everything. And if, the, if somebody on, on your end um, tells the station to initiate a, uh, a configuration modification, they can upload your entire configuration out of your site, mod it, and have it re-downloaded to your system, i.e. They can, they can change, they can change um, the, the access restrictions that are applied to certain accounts. They can add new accounts. They can delete accounts. They can change open and close times that you may have restricted for certain areas for reasons. Um, and it's not that odd a scenario that, that someone could get that kind of uh, elevated privilege to, to, to do those things with your system. And the reason I say that is you would be amazed what you can learn by simply shoulder surfing the install tech when he's at your place. Uh, case in point, um, one of my facilities while I was walking around behind the ADT guy, I, I at this point actually know the ADT tech install login for the entire continental US. So I can log in as an ADT install tech because guess what? He was dumb enough to tell me that no, this is, this is we all use it everywhere. So, um, and no, I'm not gonna tell you what it is. You will if you give him a cookie. <laughs> so, um, and, and if you do figure it out and you get busted, I, I will not testify on your behalf. <laughs> and, and don't bother, don't bother Jennifer Granick or the EFS people because they're going to just tell them, they're, they're just going to tell you good luck. Okay. More, more deployment considerations. As I said, network QS is now basically the most important thing right, right, you know, right up there with firewalling. You, you, you know, those two now become equally, if not sort of interchangeably important. Because if you flood your system, um, you flood your network, now, now your alarm system's not gonna be able to, to communicate back to the central station, which means you're gonna start getting a lot of false alarms. Um, if, you're in a regular, if you're in a regular facility that's allowed to use the backup dialer, it's not quite as big an issue. Um, you're gonna still get calls from Honeywell or ADT telling you, or Chubb telling you, hey, you know, we, we've got a communication failure. And do you really wanna spend all day long constantly picking up the phone and going, no, everything's fine? Yes? Uh, I'm getting to that. <laughs> but it, it, it states that the, the alarm must be on a separate line, but it also states that you, it also states very definitively no two-way communication. And the dialer does indeed allow two-way communication. But, but the other issue that you brought up, I am getting to that. Um, and as I said earlier, uh, I, I have been required by my sponsor to say this is not at this point and I cannot imply that it will be, although wink, wink, I'm, I'm working with them. Um, official U.S. policy on how to, how to protect uh, any system that may be uh, monitored via the net as opposed to RF or, um, or lease line. Um, so basically, yeah, routing issues are going to become the most important thing that you have to have to deal with. And frankly, you can only control all the way up to your next top router. At that point, it's out of your hands, which is one of the reasons why I tried to explain to them before. They allowed all the alarm systems to say, no, we don't offer these other services to you. Sorry, take it or leave it, that it was a bad idea. Because you know, how often do you have problems routing on the net? Pretty much every day. Uh, the, other, the other issue is now <clears throat> angry Eastern Bloc teenagers can come talk to your alarm system. And the last, the last, the last issue is, unless you do as the gentleman in the back mentioned, and as, as most people that that, de that live in this, that particular environment are required to do, and should if they don't already do, um, is that it's not a good idea to put this straight on your, your your LAN, because now it's it's just another node, just like all the desktop boxes, which means, which 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 will mean that that you know. Not necessarily people who are gonna maliciously mess with it, although some some probably will. But if you get if you get a box that's infected with a worm, you know, it's gonna flood the network, cause you problems. 
So, you know, and, and beyond that, you know, it means, it means all the guys in the golf carts and the, and the flashlights with, with the nice shiny badges actually have to make nice with all of you guys. <laughs> and, you know, how often, how often do, do, you know, black t-shirt wearing shut-ins enjoy talking to the guy in the golf cart? It doesn't work out really well. Okay, uh, some of the disruption scenarios, because as I, as I stated, uh, the point of our project is we don't, we don't really need access to the alarm system. We're, we're not interested in taking it over and, and you know, making it do what we want, all that, although that might be a nice mystery box um, game for next, next DC. But, but basically all I care about is can I make your alarm system useless? Because that's all I need. Um, so the, the, the DMP guys and the, and the alarm net guys, unfortunately, both think that the fact that, oh, we have no, you, you scan it and you see no open ports, so therefore it's safe. Um, but guess what? They talk IP. So they talk to the network. If they can talk to the network, the network can talk back. Um, so, you know, what happens when you flood the network? Well, it depends on the reporting window that you have configured in your, in your system. If your reporting window is once 24 hours, I'm pretty sure at some point I'm going to figure out that my network's being flooded within that 24 hours and, and take care of it before it flags the system as, as having communication failure and, and people start getting calls. However, facilities like, like the one I live in, I have to have a reporting time that's like three minutes. So, you know, I start getting lots of false positives every day and they are false positive. I mean, any time I get a hiccup in my network routing, I get a false positive. So, you know, what happens when, when you set, t what happens when you set your own, uh, send your own resets back to the, the system? Same thing, you know, the thing doesn't talk to the other end, eventually you hit that reporting window and you start getting phone calls. Um, now, the other thing is, is we, we, we haven't had much luck, but we're, we're certain that it's possible. Um, since these things don't actually use DNS, they, they only talk to, they only talk to, to IP um, uh, on the network. So DNS really isn't an issue because they, they don't even bother with DNS. But frankly, at that point, ARP cache poisoning becomes very important because uh, if you can figure out what, what the, the uh, you know, uh, all you got to do is figure out what the MAC address of the next upstream hop is on the system. Poison the ARP cache, and then, and then tell it you're the next hop. Tell it you're also the reporting uh, system IP, and now it's talking to you. Um, and you know, frankly, if if you got if you got the alarm net stuff in your facility, and you go out to eBay and you spend your 130 bucks, now you've got the, uh, the your own your own little monitoring system, ARP cache poison. Tell it, quit talking to the guy over there, over in Frank, Florida, frankly. That's where ADT keeps their boxes. Not that I'm encouraging people to go look for them. And uh, now you tell them, I'm really the box in Florida, even though all of a sudden you're, you're only one hop away. <laughs> so. Again, my disclaimer, this is my solution. This is not official government policy. This is only mine based on you know, common sense from having done this kind of stuff for 17 years. My own experiences dealing in all sorts of facilities, both both regular business facilities, my own home, and and other facilities on behalf of the man, and then stuff I've gleaned from all the uh, various tech install manuals that I've managed to to sequester away when I'm dealing with some of the techs and they forget things at lunch. So. Um, Basically, what we did at my facility, and, I, and I'm trying to, at this point with the, the project that I'm going to, after DEF CON here, open up to the public, is where we, we basically decided that, that, well, it made sense, as the gentleman back there pointed out, um, that not only, not only would uh, SCI facilities be better, benefit from having their, their system segregated on its own line, but everybody would. So we thought, well, if, if, if the uh, vendors aren't going to bother trying to solve this, solve this problem on the, on the hardware side on theirs, then why not put a piece of hardware of our own design that we know is, has been um, you know, thoroughly vetted and does the job properly and, and has uh, security mitigation issues, uh, security mitigation uh, methods in place. 
So what we did, what, we, what, what, what I've been doing on the policy side is, is trying, to put destroy, uh, trying to put together a, a deployment policy. One of the things would be insist that, that, you know, don't put it on your land. Go pull in a DSL line because you know, DSL lines are like 20 bucks a month. Um, so pull in a DSL line because, frankly, as, we mentioned in the fr as I mentioned in the first talk, you know, POTS lines and facilities are common. So, you know, find an unused POTS line. Flip it over to D <clears throat> excuse me. Flip it over to DSL, and then go get yourself a you know a Northlink account or whatever for for just generic, you know no frills no frills net access DSL net access because that's all you need. And then and then the QoS becomes less 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 of a, a worry because now you've only got one one node talking on that network. Um, QoS is still important, but it's not nearly as important because you're not going to have to worry about other nodes on that network. At least you would hope not if you properly uh, follow layer one security, uh, physical security issues and lock it away. Um, but at that point now, QoS becomes less of a worry. So you've only got one node. You've got, you've got your reporting node. You've got your firewall. You've got your DSL router. Beyond that, you can't control it, so why worry about it? Um, one of the other things that I do basically because because it's, it's a, um, a requirement for me, but it's also just part of my paranoid nature, is the DSL account is actually in um, an individual's name. And no, it's not mine, so don't go look for it. Um, and, then, and then we actually have all the billing go to a disassociated mailbox, so. Yeah, those are the, but those are those are actually standard. Those are operating procedure issues, not not really directly relevant, but somewhat pertinent. Um, so what we did was was we started to build our own firewall. We we decided the easiest way to, to build an embedded firewall was either a, either a PC wrap box or frankly I I, I like the the Socrus boxes, so I default to the Socrus boxes because they're nice and cheap, really nice boxes, um, and frankly after. I think like next week, Sokers is finally coming out a, with a really nice 686 box, only about 300 bucks, in a 19-inch uh, uh, one U rack mountable case for like 350 bucks, which you know not bad. I mean, granted, it's a little more than a Linksys router, but you're not going to want a Linksys router as your as, as your your firewall for this, for a few reasons. Um, so basically, we're working on building a Linux system from source. Uh, we're looking at whether we want to hack together our own distro or whether we just want to build a, a modification of BusyBox. Um, the cost is potentially less in the long run because in order to get a system that really is the quality you want protecting your alarm system, you're not going to get a Linksys. You're going to get a, 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 one of the commercial ones, which are going to potentially cost you a few thousand dollars um, as opposed to couple hundred bucks and maybe a day or two of your time. Um, you also have more control over the configuration. I mean, when you buy a commercial firewall, uh, and granted they're very good, but you, you don't have full control. You, you can't add or, or you can't add or modify any of the services really, uh, at least not without voiding the warranty on it and then it becomes your own very expensive version of this. Um, and, and, and in my case, Doing, doing this allowed me to, to standardize my hardware and software solution across, across the board. So if, you're, if you have a situation like I do where you, where you deal with multiple facilities um, and, and you know, they're spread out all over the world, all over the country, all over the world or whatever, you can still guarantee that, that, that uh, troubleshooting issues is going is to be kept to a minimum because you know, the hardware is the same. Software is the same, so it, it really reduces your troubleshooting issues to, to find out why the alarm system's not really happy. Um, some of the choices we made also, um, for, for whatever personal reasons we decided, is, um, is um, that and for some of the reasons why we, we decided to make our own firewall is, is because we, we decided to use uh, syslog ng as our, as our logger instead of syslog. Reason for that is because syslog ng will actually report over TCP, which will also allow you to wrap it in um, an SSL tunnel, thus protecting your firewalling logs. If if you decide that you want to do off box logging, um, you can mitigate you can mitigate you know the network access on that by firewalling off the the interface that you connect to to your your 
um, your administration monitoring network uh, and simply and simply tunnel the logs over there so that the, you don't have any issues with sniffing or uh, injecting at that point. Um, and we also wanted to include log watch and log rotate, at least in my in my um, in my instance, because frankly I'm lazy, and so I, I like I like having log watch, so it'll mail me my logs every morning, and I can see what's been going on with people probing the system. And then um, I, I frankly did not want to build postfix or send mail or anything simply to move those logs off. So I, I, my this allowed me to to put SSMTP because that's really all you need. I mean, it's just a little, simple little binary and just shutter your stuff off to a mail hub and call it a day. So some of the issues that I had to deal with was, you know, how, if you're responsible for multiple, um, multiple uh, alarm net monitors, you know, how are you going to monitor the logs? That, that will explain to you why I, I did the log watch thing because frankly I wanted to move all my logs off onto my desktop because, you know, it's, it's one thing to monitor multiple sensors throughout a building. Uh, it's another thing to monitor multiple alarm sensors uh, or alarm monitoring hardware throughout the country or throughout the world. It's, you know, you can't continually every morning fly to a different area and go check the logs. So. This allowed us to, you know, this allowed us to, to uh, run our log, uh, run our logger over S tunnel to protect the logs, and then and then uh, run log watch to fire them off to us every morning, so that we have a centralized, uh, nice little thing in our inbox instead of having to, to actually go out to each of the one, each of the uh, firewalls and actually log into them and monitor the logs manually. Um, and also, building our own firewall allows us to control the patching. Yeah, you, when, I, when we built our own firewall, that allowed us to only put in what we wanted. So we don't have a whole bunch of extra junk in there. Like, for example, I mean, if you, if you, if you go to, the, you go to the, the trouble of just creating a, a minimal install of Fedora, you're still going to get all the wireless things and all that. Because, and and, and even, even sillier than that, you're going to get cups installed um, solely because that's part of the uh, LSB package on Red Hat and, and you can't actually remove it without really mangling the, the distro. So, you know, this way, this, building our own version of it allowed us to keep a lot of the stuff that had no business being on the firewall off of it in the first place. It also made it a much, much smaller thing to deploy, which makes it easier to simply just put up, we just put up an image, let, let the admins down, you know, suck it down off one of the internal servers, uh, run DD to pop, pop it off onto a CF card, throw it in the soakers box, turn it on, and call it a day. Um, and, then, and then it also allowed us to have far more, uh, uh, far more control over the, the, the firewalling rule set because, you know, we could literally get a shell if we if we needed, and manually manipulate um, the rule sets on on the fly as as we saw fit, as opposed to you know being restricted to whatever interface was provided to us and having no other options. Um, and if we wanted to, as I mentioned earlier, if we want to add other other functionality, whether or not it's a good idea, we you know we would at that point be allowed to add things like inline snort capability, which would create some you know some some semblance of, a, of an active uh, IPS. What, what we're doing at this point is um, I, I've been uh, I've been dealing with a lot of a lot of uh, IPS vendors and stuff frankly because I'm, I'm in uh, the uh, AHA group with HD Moore and a few other people and so we've been we, some of us have been talking about it um, trying to trying to develop uh, traffic signatures um, from these so that you can identify them, not necessarily for nefarious purposes, but so that it, so that we can have a, a we can get a good handle on what a, what is actually good traffic for these things, thus making it easier to pick up anomalous traffic, and and therefore if we if we decide to add you know inline snort functionality or whatever, now we have a, a, an easy way to, to employ signatures that will actually do stateful packet inspection and say, um, even though this looks like it's a, a, an acceptable firewall, a, a piece, of, piece of traffic for the firewall, looking at the payload, I know it's malicious, you know, handle it however I see fit. Um, and the other thing that, that we have ongoing right now is we're actually, um, in addition to trying to, to, to uh, Pick out what what the shared secret is, just for our own curiosity. Um, we're we're t 
trying to find people that, that are that are um, pretty handy with crypto that are interested in, in testing to see how effectively um, the, the crypto was implemented in these items. Because, uh, granted, they're UL 2040 certified, which is great, but you know, maybe maybe they missed something, and maybe it's, it, there are actual you know ways to, to bypass the encryption and 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 grab grab a, a look at the proprietary um, communication protocol, and then create your own uh, man in the middle. And um, actually, one of the, one of the uh, points under there under the effectiveness is the, uh, the timestamp and uh, recent, uh, let's see, it was uh, middle of last week, one of the guys that's looking at the, uh, the traffic captures that we have up on the wiki, um, he had mentioned that he thought it was a, it was a timestamp for the IV, but when uh, I and a couple other people uh, took a look, closer look at it, we realized actually there was a pattern and it looked to be the same, so obviously it's not a timestamp because it would change a little bit every single time and it doesn't. Um, so that's actually a misnomer. Uh, now, one of the things I have been trying to, to discuss with the vendors to, I got five, all right. Now, one, one of the things I have been trying to discuss with the vendors to, to take care of this is um, to get at least a minimum of, of authenticity to the entire uh, communications process is trying to see if I can't convince them to implement an IP stack. In their, in their client and, and, and monitoring uh, receiver stations. So you, you at least will have a modicum of, of, of you know, secure feeling that, that you are indeed talking to the, the far, the distant end that, uh, that, that you think you are. Um, thus, thus not eliminating, but, but at least making the, the ARP cache portioning issue a little bit more difficult to pull off. Um, and then basically at, at, at this point, um, that is actually the URL at the bottom is the wiki. Um, as I said, we haven't actually gotten a, a, a fully functional um, version of the, the firewalling base out yet. But once we do, um, a link to the, the subversion repository for it um, will actually go up on the wiki. Um, so you know, anybody who wants to go to that wiki, get yourself a count. Um, and and you know start helping out, looking at traffic, uh, making suggestions, helping out with with working on the firewall and code or anything. You're more than welcome to. Um, the one thing I would suggest is uh, I'm I'm really cheap, so I didn't bother paying DreamHost for a static IP. So there are no TLS connections. So frankly, if you get yourself an account here at DefCon, you better change the password as soon as you get home because somebody else is going to start using it. <laughs> um, Basically, um, that's it. So, if anybody's got any questions, uh, I'll be I'll be happy to answer them. Um, and thank you very much for your time. Yes. Yes. They actually, they're they're actually pretty pretty good about that too. Oddly enough, they really are. Um, like I said, like I said, um, the, uh, the the alarm net guys—they're the ones that I got more of their install manuals and stuff. Because and, and and frankly, it's not it, it, on that. It's not the vendor that's the problem. Getting getting the manuals. I got the manuals from the from the from the install techs because they they don't pay attention. They go, oh, uh, I'm half done, but I got to go out and get a smoke. So they go, you know, and they and they leave the manual sitting right there. So I run over the copier, I copy it, I put it back. Now I got a copy of the manual. They they don't look around, they don't know, you know, they don't take the manual with them. But frankly, as I said, that's not the vendor. That's 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 the Chubb employee or the Honeywell employee or the DMP or the mom and pop alarm shop if it's a residence. So you know, that's that's something that's out of their reach. So I don't actually blame them for the fact that I have a lot of their install stuff. Um, that's that's not their fault, you know. They they can only they can only tell the vendor, please be careful with this, and they can't follow them around and babysit them. Anybody else? Okay. Thank thank you very much. <laughs>